Well, ladies and gentlemen, welcome along on this rather chilly morning. I was here today for the Royal Flying Doctor Service. I spent a lot of years of my life living in the country, and um, we called on the Royal Flying Doctor Service several times in that period of time. And there was obviously just an absolute lifeline. And one of the people that had to be flown out of Kalgoorlie was my husband. And it gives me great pleasure to actually introduce him today. My husband is Jeff Horsley, um, who is the managing what are you? The general, general manager, manager of aviation. Of aviation with the Royal Flying <laughs> My father was flown out of Kalgoorlie by the Royal Flying Doctor Service. My mother-in-law was flown out. One of our sons was flown out, and I was flown out. So we've got our money's worth out of the Royal Flying Doctor Service. We figure we probably should give something back. That's our Pilata, our brand new um, Rio Tinto Life Flight PC24 jet on its first touchdown in Australian soil in Broome. Actually, that was the day it arrived in Broome. I'm just on, just on approach across the flats. You know, the tide was obviously uh, on its way out there. Uh, it was a very exciting day for us. So it was a, um, the introduction of a whole new generation of aircraft for the Flying Doctor Service. So we go back and we were talking, uh, we were actually talking earlier about the original uh, Fox Moth, which is still around, the actual original um, Western section aircraft, which operated out of Port Hedland at the beginning of the Second World War. Had a hangar fall on it and it crushed it but someone bought the wreck and lovingly restored it. So we actually use it quite often. It, it lives in serpentine and we often use it for promotional material. At our ball last year, it was, in the, was at the entrance to our ball uh, and the people that own it are very generous to us, uh, allowing us to access to the aircraft whenever we like. So it's quite a, quite a step from that to a uh, purpose-built uh, PC-24 jet made in Switzerland and a mere uh, $13 million each. It's as if it's come down in the swamp. It's about to land in the swamp, yes. <laughs> Actually, the Broome Airport's not very far past there, so. Um, <laughs> but it is, it's quite a spectacular approach into there. Um, Roebuck Bay is just over here. That was a great day. We actually spent a couple of days up in Broome to welcome it into the country uh, and had quite a contingent of us up there. Uh, it was very, very exciting for us. Um, now there, there we have two of these in Western Australia and there's one in, in South Australia. It's just arrived in South Australia. One of these is based in Broome and, and one at Jandicott. And I don't know what central section are going to do with theirs. I'd say it's probably stay in Adelaide. Um, that particular one there is the one that lives in Jandicott at the moment and the other one that lives in Broome has a K call sign and it's called Kimberley because it lives in the Kimberleys. So that's me. I'm the general manager of aviation and uh, Lorraine's already um, done our welcome to country so I'll put it up there for us. So, so about me, I started in aviation back in the 80s. I um, was, I worked for a a family company which I inevitably bought and decided that that was a terrible way to make a living. Decided to sell the company and the only other thing I ever really wanted to do in my life was join the RFDS. The opportunity came along for me to join the RFDS so I joined the RFDS as a pilot, as a relieving pilot and had the great pleasure of working in every base in Western Australia so I spent time in Mika Thara, quite a lot of time in Mika Thara, uh, Derby, Port Hedland and Kalgoorlie and Jandicott as well obviously. We closed the Derby base about uh, two and a half years ago now and, and opened a base in Broome. It was purely and simply Broome has sort of become the centre center of the Kimberley, the major hospitals in Broome. And it was really an economic decision that it was, um, it was better to position ourselves in Broome uh, at that time. So the decision was taken to move. And interestingly, as, uh, as, was, as we were discussing before, before we started this morning, the Derby base actually used to belong to the Victorian section not Western operation. We took it all back in the late 90s. There were several different sections in Western Australia. So Eastern Goldfield section in Kalgoorlie was a section all on its own. Uh, and Derby was run by Victorian section. And then there was Western operations that had um, base at Jandicott, uh, Carnarvon and Port Hedland. Mika Thara went in after they closed Carnarvon. The decision was taken to merge all the sections together and just become Western operations. So that was taken. Then um, we took the Derby section back under our wing and, and Eastern Goldfields became part of Western Operations. So now Western Operations runs the whole of Western Australia and the Victorian section has no aeroplanes. They used to have about uh, 92 ambulances, believe it or not, in uh, Victoria. So they lost their aeromedical contract to, an, to a private operator and then they went into road transport and have been very, very successful because road transport's way cheaper than trying to operate aeroplanes. So Reverend John Flynn, Jimmy Darcy died up in near Halls Creek. But the, how this came about was uh, Jimmy Darcy had, had an accident. He was a stockman who had an accident. Uh, there was no chance of getting any medical help to him. The doctor that was trying to help him was doing it with the postmaster in Halls Creek. So he was telling the postmaster what to do on the radio and the postmaster was doing the operation on Jimmy Darcy. The doctor then left to get to Halls Creek 
Uh, Jimmy Darcy died about 16 hours before the doctor arrived at Halls Creek because it took him a couple of days to get there, obviously. And that was sort of what inspired the Royal Flying Doctor Service. So Reverend Flynn said, look, we need to find a way to get provision for people in the country. We've got to help the people in remote areas with medical assistance. We can't just have people dying for things that they don't have to die from because they can't get medical assistance. The original Inland Aerial Mission, as it was called at the time, which turned into the Royal Flying Doctor Service, started in Queensland. And the first flight was flown by a Qantas pilot. Reverend Flynn's plan was that he would have pilots who were doctors, or doctors really who were pilots, because you can't say it the other way around. Otherwise all the doctors would be most miffed with me. So that was the original plan, but over the years as it's matured, of course, the situation's become that you just can't be that. We really have to have individual disciplines in the aircraft. So the, the model when it, when it started in Western Australia was that it was a pilot and a nurse, um, and now it's a pilot and a nurse on every flight, and it's about 60% of our flights that have a doctor as well. And there it was. I think we might have taken a little bit of licence on that one, but that wasn't actually the, that was the first aeroplane in Western Australia, but not the first one in Queensland. Um, so that type of aircraft, and as I say, there is still one of those around, which is fantastic. Five bases, as I said, Jandicott, which is the biggest base at the moment. Uh, Broome, which is our second biggest base, and that's a brand new, pretty much, and it's an absolutely magnificent building up there. It's really beautiful. Very well funded by the Commonwealth Government and Lotteries West, which we're uh, very grateful for. Kalgoorlie, Meekathara, which is our smallest base, but incredibly one of our busiest bases. And one of the great things about Meekathara is its location in terms of it, its reach. So with our Meeka base in here, we can reach out into the desert areas, we can reach into the Pilbara, and they can also reach into the southwest. So the Meeka base for us is vitally important. It's difficult to staff. Meekathara is not the nicest place in the world for people to live, uh, you know, because of the isolation. Uh, so it can be difficult for us to staff it. And unfortunately for every new pilot that starts with us, that's where they end up. Probably the, the guy that I take my hat off to the most, he, he went to Mika with his wife when he started with us. They raised their kids. Uh, he did six years in Mika Thara, which is a bit more than usual. Uh, and then he's finally made his way to Jandicott base, but it's basically done on when, oper when op opportunities come up, um, people will give an opportunity to move bases. But then it's uh, effectively done on how long you've been with the organisation as to whether you get first preference for the, to move to those bases. Broome is our most preferred base these days. Everyone loves the lifestyle. Uh, used to be Jandicott, now it's Broome. Everybody wants to get to Broome. I reckon it's because they don't work very hard and it's a great lifestyle, but <laughs> <laughs> they would dispute that. The other thing too is uh, the flying up through here is absolutely spectacular. We actually do quite a lot of um, evacuations to Darwin. So we would move an average of 2,000 patients a year to Darwin out of the Kimberley because the Darwin Hospital is very good. And WA Country Health have an allocation of beds in the Darwin Hospital. So we often take patients out of the Kimberley into Darwin. And I can tell you that having worked in this area and flown up through this area is just incredible. If, if it was anywhere else in the world and it wasn't so isolated and there weren't so many things up there that wanted to bite you, eat you, kill you, it would be full of people. <laughs> it is so beautiful. It is an incredibly beautiful place. When you're out in those remote areas, particularly out these areas where all the remote indigenous communities out in here, you can sort of get how come there were so many Dreamtime stories. Because the place just engulfs you. The silence is the most deafening sound you've ever heard. It is quite spectacular. Um, and I get why people want to go up there. And I get, how, I get how people stay there. They go there and just never leave because it is an incredible place, apart from the horrendous weather. It is, a, it is an incredible place. Well, one of the great things about the weather up there too is it's quite different. The weather down here can be, the thunderstorms and things down here can be a bit sneaky. Um, but up there, they're pretty obvious. They tell you where they are all the time. So when you're flying around up there at two o'clock in the morning in the middle of the wet season and there's thunderstorms everywhere, there's constant lightning so you can see where they are. That's quite helpful. Um, <laughs> as a pilot, I can tell you that's really helpful. Uh, whereas down here, they're a bit sneakier. They don't have lightning that much. So a lot of our work isn't actually as glamorous as it might seem. So we don't, so, so about 80% of our work is actually into hospital transfer. It's just patients that need to be moved to, prime, to, to big hospitals. So lots of people that we just bring back to Perth because they need to be moved into a tertiary hospital. Um, and they can't get the specialist services in the, in the regional um, areas. And believe it or not, the two busiest places are Bunbury and Geraldton. That's the where we do our most of our hospital transfers from, are Bunbury and Geraldton. The rest of it is evacuation work, so accidents, snake bites, all those sorts of things that you might see about. People particularly, um, and particularly lots of tourists in the Kimberley, we, during the dry season, because um, the Kimberley fills up with tourists in the dry season, and we actually 
do bring quite a few people out who've been injured one way or another um, in the Kimberley. So th those are primary evacuations. We also do um, clinics. We operate clinic services out of Mekathara and Kalgoorlie and in Broome and Kununurra. Um, the Kimberley clinics, are the, there's a clinic every day of the week in the Kimberley, sometimes two. Uh, Kalgoorlie we run about three a week and Mekathara's um, one a week out of Meka. So our doctors just go out on those and just run just a GP clinic for anyone that, that needs them. And we've just been, just been uh, allocated some funding by the federal government to do mental health clinics as well. So we'll be getting involved in those in the, in the not too distant future. So our Queensland cousins do, do a lot of that. So a lot of the Queensland RFDS work is that primary health work, it's clinic work. Um, not so much into hospital transfer or uh, evacuation work. Because Queensland has a lot of really um, big population centres quite close together, whereas we don't. You know, other than so, it's a long way between our major population centres. So you know, once you leave Perth and go to Geraldton, the next major population centre from there would be Caratha, and then Broome. So it's a very long way between them. Each state operates quite differently, and we actually all operate autonomously. So we have a central Royal Flying Doctor Service based in Canberra, but each state is actually autonomous, and we fight each other over federal funding every year. We argue that we've got the biggest area to cover and they argue we've got the lowest population. Do you do a lot of work on the Nullarbor? Yeah, quite a lot on Nullarbor. We have primary health clinics go to the Nullarbor once a week too, so that helps a fair bit. It's a couple of emergency road landing strips on the Nullarbor um, as well, one of which we don't often do them, but we have actually done one road landing in the last 18 months that I, that I can recall on the Nullarbor. Only the turboprops can do that, the jet can't land on the road. It's not wide enough or strong enough to carry the jet. And we have two up here between Carnarvon and, and uh, Geraldton. There's two road landing strips there as well. Uh, one at Nanyatarra and I can't remember where the other one is, but it's north of Nanyatarra on the way up. But Western Australia, of course, has a lot of challenges in terms of providing healthcare because of the, the small population and the vast distances and the remoteness of some of those populations, um, particularly um, the central desert areas in here. A um, lot of communities in there, but very small. A lot of very small community. You would probably recall a few years ago the state government said we're going to have to shut some of these communities down because we can't provide them services and make some of those communities a bit larger because health was one of the real issues of being able to provide services to particularly to these communities in here and some of the communities that you can't see but are in here um, very very difficult to provide services for the you know there's about 50 people or 100 people or, they have a right to health services and all those sorts of things, the same as everybody else does. So we would have been quite pleased had that actually happened because it would make life a bit easier for us that we're not trying to get to places, particularly those remote places, and inevitably the serious accidents happen at night. And that, that is quite challenging from our, from our point of view. Our aircraft, so we have 16 Pilatus PC-12s, so that's the aircraft at the top, single engine turboprops. They're a fantastic aeromedical aeroplane, absolutely brilliant aeromedical aeroplane. I have a big door at the back here. There's here, passenger loading here. So the patient loading is done at the back. We've got a lifting device that was actually invented in Western Australia for us to, to use to load the patients on and off. So it removes the physical aspects of us loading and unloading the patients, which is fantastic. Not just straight on a stretcher, the wheels fold up and then they go and then we just roll them around. There's another set of wheels on, actually on the, the stretcher base. We can fit two stretcher patients into the PC-12. Cruise speed of 245 knots, actually. Some, they are a little bit faster than that. And a range of about 900 nautical miles, which is around 1,600 kilometres. We swapped into the single-engine aircraft from the twin-engine aircraft. The reliability of the engine in these aeroplanes is absolutely phenomenal. When we break it down, we do more movements, takeoffs and landings than Qantas and Virgin and we do them in much more remote places and much more inhospitable times of the day and night. And the safety record of these aeroplanes is absolutely phenomenal. Absolutely phenomenal. We've only ever, ever had one engine failure in one of these aeroplanes in all that time, in all those movements and all that time. And that wasn't caused by us, it was caused by an overhaul that was done incorrectly. So they're a phenomenally reliable, safe aeroplane and actually um, state of the art. They um, are the latest technology actually avionics and operational point of view, absolute latest technology, so they're a fantastic aeroplane. And as I said, our two PC-24 Rio Life Flight jets, they are no longer Australia's only aeromedical jet because central section have now got one. 
uh, but they can carry three patients and two medical crews. Uh, 740 kilometre an hour speed, and they actually can be a little, just a fractionally faster than that as well. And they can take off and land on short runways. So it's about a, they need about 100 metres more than the PC-12 to operate in and out of, and they can operate in and out of gravel as well as sealed runways, same as the, the 12 can. So they are a, quite a phenomenal aeroplane. We've, we've recently retired the last of our, so we have a, a life limit on our PC-12, all our aircraft, so we recently retired our last of our old style PC-12s and gone in, and all of our aircraft now are the latest technology PC-12s. And we don't have any due for retirement of those anytime soon, which I'm really quite pleased about because they cost $7 million each. Um, so <laughs> we actually bring those into the country uh, when we buy those, we buy them from Switzerland, we ferry them across from Switzerland, um, which I was going to bring the last one over, but unfortunately the opportunity went past, so I had to send a couple of other people. I was very disappointed. Um, and then when they're here, we fit them out with the aeromedical interior. So we basically get them empty and fit them out with an aeromedical interior. It takes six weeks and costs just over a million dollars, about $1.2 million to put the aeromedical interior into it. The PC-24 is actually fitted out with the aeromedical interior in Switzerland and then we pick it up as is and bring it over. We have a different stretcher configuration as well for the, for the PC-12. There's a single stretcher configuration where we actually change the whole aircraft configuration and that's for, um, for what we call bariatric patients, so patients over 160 kilos um, won't fit on our stretchers the normal stretchers, so we have to actually reconfigure the aeroplane with the, with the large stretcher, which will take a patient up to 285 kilos. And we do have a couple of those um, that we fly regu quite regularly. We bring them to Perth for treatment. So there's several different configurations and we can operate the 24, and we also have the neonatal configurations for both the aircraft as well, because we actually do quite a lot of neonatal transfers. So the, the 24 will take two neonatal stretchers um, and the 12 will take one um, but the, the 12 week you can put in a neonatal stretcher and leave the, the regular stretcher in there and still use that. And the neonatal stretchers are basically flying humidity cribs. Yes, we do have babies born on board. Um, I actually, I can remember bringing a lady back from Albany one night with a, uh, all of our nurses are midwives by the way, so um, we were bringing a lady back who was in labour and the nurse said to me, if this baby's born I'll need to look after the mum, you're going to have to look after the baby. I might be a bit busy, she said, you got five kids, you'll work it out. <laughs> so, but I've never had a baby born, but baby didn't end up being born. Actually, I remember doing a flight with the same nurse and there was a baby, a quite upset baby, that was a toddler. Uh, mum was quite sick and the toddler was quite, wasn't well. And we have an intercom system through the aircraft so that we can talk to each other. And, but we can isolate the medical crews if there's things that we if we're talk, trying to talk to air traffic control and don't, and they're busy and we don't, and we don't want them talking over the top of us. And uh, I remember this particular day that she had the baby on, the, or the toddler on her lap, and this toddler was screaming into the microphone. And so I kept isolating it. And she kept <laughs> unisolating it. She kept saying to me, no, "If I'm putting up with it, you are." <laughs> so as I said, seven million dollars to purchase and medically fit out the PC-12. And as you can see, that's the PC-12 being loaded with the patient at the moment. That patient's obviously got a spinal injury because that is the scoop stretcher which we don't use unless it's really critical spinal injury. So it's a stretcher that's that actually split in half and you slide it underneath and clip it together and then lift the patient up and that way you don't have to move the patient if they've got a spinal or neck injury. Yeah. They've got the old hard collar so that's quite an old photo but that's the old hard collar. We have a soft red soft collar that we use now for those. I reckon just looking at that aircraft I think our fundraising people have been a bit cheeky because I can tell by looking at the interior of that aeroplane that that's actually a central section aeroplane, not one of them. So the running costs of the aircraft, uh, $1,700 an hour for the 12 and $5,300 an hour for the 24. All of our services are absolutely free for Australian citizens. International tourists, it's recovered through their uh, travel insurance, but if you're an Australian citizen, it's no cost whatsoever. The last 12 months in WA, we flew over 8, eight million kilometres. And our coordination centre received 38,000 calls for assistance. However, that's 104 calls a day. So we have three people in the coordination centre plus a doctor. So the doctor's job in the coordination centre is to provide clinical coordination and make decisions about which patients will require. So we have a scale system, um, priority system, one, two and three. And the doctor makes a tells the coordinators which are the priority patients and which ones we need to go and get straight away. We have doctors at each base spread across the, the state and um, when they're not flying, when they're on shift and not flying, they'll be taking the calls and doing the medical assessments. 
So they, they do the medical assessments, they'll provide it back to our clinical coordinator, who will then tell the coordinators, well, this is a priority one, we need to go and get this patient now. Priority two, you know, we've got four hours till we have to launch, or priority three, which is 48 hours. So as I said, we, the remote clinics, 1,813 of those, with over 15,000 patients. And the medical chests are another big part of what we do. So a lot of um, mining companies and stations, places like that, have our medical chests. They're a big green chest, um, and inside that chest is a whole pile of um, medical equipment, um, drugs, those sorts of things. Um, back in the old days, it used to be dial up the radio and try and get hold of the flying doctor. These days, it's get on the telephone. Satellite phone at worst. Get on the phone, talk to the doctor. They, the doctor will then work out from what's wrong with that patient and then give the people the advice of what to give them to either keep them alive until we get there or fix what the problem is. If it's something like you know an infection or something, they need antibiotics, they can prescribe those. There's a whole pile of forms that get filled out and then those get replenished if they've used them. Uh, they're a fantastic service and that's been, that's been a part of the Flying Doctor for, well, since um, not long after the Second World War, the medical chests, and they haven't really changed other than the medications and the sorts of things that have gone in them. But the actual process hasn't really changed uh, in that time. That's in conjunction with the telehealth service. So. So we also run clinics via telehealth as well, so that people can call in and talk to our doctors. Our doctors are all very highly trained emergency medicine specialists, just as our nurses are, um, and our nurses are all emergency nurses. You'll find actually around the city, particularly around the city, quite a few of our doctors and nurses work in emergency departments as well. So they don't work actually full-time for us, they work part-time for us, and they'll do part-time in emergency departments around the city. They quite enjoy coming to work for us because it's a lot tamer than working in an emergency department. <laughs> so we've transported 8,535 sick and injured patients for medical treatment, and 70% of those come to Perth. So 23 people a day. Our busiest day was 31 patients, I remember it well, and 15,886 landings last year. The statistics are quite, quite mind-boggling. So we're in the middle of it all day, every day, and you don't really notice until you sort of sit back and look at it and think, wowee, that's a pretty incredible um, service that is provided out there. So the backbone of our operation is, a, is that beautiful Swiss Pilatus PC-12 aircraft, which has, are the absolutely ideal aircraft for aeromedical work. There's no doubt about it. The Swiss know how to build things. That's the way to donate. I'll have to put that part in, like all charities, desperately short of funding. And we are a registered charity, but there are hundreds and hundreds of registered charities in Australia, and we're all competing. So obviously, yeah, and, and um, every, every registered charity in the country does worthwhile things as well. So, you know, it's quite. So the day in the life. So that's, um, that's Dr. DeVries, Theo, and um, our pilot, Gary Bracken, who's been with us for quite a long time. The day in the life of an RFDS crew member is basically we have, uh, so rather than complicate things out of Jandicott, we have four day shifts that operate and uh, three night shifts. So if you're on a night shift, generally uh, you'll start work at six at night and your shift's 12 hours. So there are three shifts, but the, one of the first shift starts at six o'clock at night and they actually go to work at six o'clock at night and then there are two shifts at eight o'clock and they stay home till they're called. So say uh, for an emergency call out shift, say the eight o'clock shift at night, you might be at home, you know, it might be about midnight and you're just um, wandering around the house trying to think of what you're gonna do while you're waiting for the phone to ring. The phone will ring, you've then got 45 minutes to get to the base and then a further 45 minutes to be airborne. Um, everybody tries to live as close to the base as they can to save themselves a bit of time. So you get a call, um, they'll, generally what they'll tell you is where you're going, what the aircraft is and what the priority is. You'll go then into the base, get ready to go and go out and I can tell you that about 50% of the jobs that you get sent on you don't end up doing. You'll get diverted somewhere along the way to go somewhere else because something more urgent's happened somewhere else. It used to be a rule of thumb that if you had a doctor on board, you were probably going to get diverted. And if you don't have a doctor on board, you're probably not going to get diverted. So that was how we used to work it out. Well, I can tell you about probably one of my very favourite cases. Uh, as a young man, we were on a night shift and we'd actually been out flying already. We got back in, it was about half past 11. And there was nothing else for us to do at that stage. And so if you're on the first night shift, you stay at the base till two in the morning. If there's nothing to do, you stay till two in the morning and then you can go home. Or there's beds that you can go and sleep in at the base as well. And when Lorraine was working in breakfast radio, I wouldn't go home at two in the morning because she was getting up at 3.30. I didn't want to wake her up because she, she gets quite grumpy. So we got back in about 11.30. There was nothing else for us to do. The doctor, on, the doctor I had on board at the time, he went upstairs to the coordination centre to 
to, to see if there was anything else for us to do and I was went and I went and made a coffee and my nurse went and was restocking the aeroplane from the job. And a call came in from Bunbury for a young, oh, sorry, 16 year old boy who had a stroke. One of the things with stroke patients is you've got to get to them really quickly because the quicker you can get to them, the better the outcome. The longer they're left before they get medical treatment, the worse the outcome. And there's a 16 year old boy who'd actually fell off his push bike and hit the side of his head and, and ruptured the vein, the, the main blood vein on the side of his head. So he'd gone into hospital, his parents had taken him into hospital complaining about a bad headache. Said, oh, you know, you're bru just bruising. And then a bit later, he had a stroke. Back straight back into emergency department. There is a, a rescue helicopter in Bunbury and there's a rescue helicopter in Jandicott. We, our doctors provide the medical crew for the rescue helicopter in Jandicott. The Bunbury hospital provides it for the, medic, for the helicopter in, in Bunbury. The doctor said, right, I'll get the helicopter going. He said, but just in case I can't get a doctor, go and get the aeroplane ready, we've got to go. So I went downstairs and started planning and, and um, getting refueled and everything ready to go. The doc called me and said, I can't get a doctor out of Bunbury, we've got to go now. So the nurse was out there, he loaded the aeroplane up straight away, the doctor came down and we got going within 15 minutes. We got this young fella and, you know, he wasn't in a very good way, that's got to be said. We loaded him up, got him back to Perth. One of the commercial TV channels did a story because he's made a complete recovery. Um, he made a total recovery. I felt, you know, I was quite upset by having kids as well. I was quite upset by the whole thing. I thought that poor kid, 16 years old, he's got a stroke, he's, he's had a stroke, he's going to have, you know, the rest of his life is going to be affected. You know, he's going to have brain injuries because of lack of blood supply to his brain. But because of that doctor's quick thinking and he's getting organised and getting us moving as quickly as we did and got the kid back here, we had a fantastic outcome and the kid has made a complete recovery. So it's one of those ones where you just get so excited about that because um, it was quite distressing at the time to see this poor young fella. But yeah, so he, um, it was good to see. Uh, he comes from Manjimup actually. He was in Bunbury at a, doing one of those um, push bike races in Bunbury. Um, but yeah, it was fantastic. So that was one of my ones that I sort of took away. Sometimes you have ones that don't have such good outcomes, but that one's one that I've always clung to as one of those moments that I was so proud of what we did and so proud of the way the team had just got moving. And that doctor in particular just kept us, said, gotta go, we gotta go, we gotta get moving. So that was, that was a great moment. And you know, there's other ones, um, lovely family in Katanning. Um, had three kids, mum went to labour with her fourth kid really, really early. Got a lovely card from them. They managed to stop the labour and then the baby went nearly full term and was born and no complications and we had a lovely card from them. So they're always really nice, those sorts of outcomes that um, are really fantastic to be a part of. So I'll stop talking and uh, ask if anyone's got any questions, anything they'd like to know. Is the flying doctor service unique to Australia? Yes, absolutely yeah. unique to Australia. There's no other service like it in the world. Yeah. Every other service in the world that has sort of started up now is a paid for. So there's some in Indonesia, there's a, a mob in Indonesia that do it. There are some private operators in Australia as well, but everything you have to pay for um, to help us. And we've got a couple of fantastic people that are working on that at the moment. So there will be something coming out about that in the not too distant future to, to get people to come and give us a hand with things. So. What about lighting on remote strips? Yep, so... Are all the cars lined up? Yes, so we do that. We actually practice that. We do practice for that. Our pilots get revalidated for that every 12 months where we land with just six lights. Um, it's lots of fun, actually. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, but yes, yes, that happens, and that, um, a bit more often than people might think. But the other one is um, lit toilet rolls are quite helpful. Um, people soak toilet rolls in Kero and light them up, which is quite helpful because they burn for quite a while. Um, but there's a whole pile of actually quite cheap solar lighting now that we can get, so approved. It's about $4,000 for a full set of solar lights. And I know several shires have going away from putting in fixed lighting and actually putting in the temporary solar lighting because it's much cheaper for them to maintain. They just put them out. And when after two years, they go and change the batteries. Um, but yeah, they've, they've, they've become uh, that technology and um, Western Power have been working with our fundraising team to, um, they've put up some money to improve lighting in locations where we didn't have lights. We've said, you know, we would like to have lights at some of these places. And so they've put the money up for about three places to put lights in and there's also a, a commonwealth funding grant that comes out every year that for airstrip upgrades uh, and those communities often come to us for support for their requests for things like lights and um, crew fencing and you know ceiling runways and those sorts of things because one of our biggest issues is livestock um, fitzroy crossing we hit kangaroos 
two kangaroos with three weeks apart at Fitzroy Crossing at night. So they wanted upgrade fencing, we're pretty pleased with that. Because, <laughs> uh, yeah, the, the, the kangaroos up there aren't very big, the wallabies aren't very big, but they still do a lot of damage when we hit them. And once we've hit them, we've got to stop because um, damage to the aircraft, so we can't go. So, um, so yeah, improve fencing and those sorts of things, improve lighting, uh, things that we're really, really uh, big on. We have had a couple of incidents. Um, we had one emergency a while ago, about 18 months ago now, where the patient attacked the nurse and the doctor. There was no sign that that was ever going to happen. Is that drug induced? No, it wasn't. Uh, no, um, no, it was just agitation in the end. Any patient that has any sort of level of psychosis, we have a policeman on board. But they're also uh, secured to the stretcher. So we have um, these um, straps that we secure them with. So any mental health patient, uh, has a, we have an escort, a policeman or woman uh, on board and they're secured to the stretcher. Now this, this particular incident, that's probably the worst part, it was, it was completely unexpected. It was a, what we can think of, and because I don't know, because I'm, you know, I'm not privy to people's medical history, but this person had been in an accident, car accident, and they suspected it may have been a head injury, that, which wasn't picked up, um, that probably caused the agitation mm -hmm. and the disorientation, and then that, that one was very serious. That was a very serious incident. Uh, there was a, not very long ago, some of our staff threatened with a machete-wielding person in a com remote community. Um, he'd attacked his wife. And when we went in to get her, he wanted to attack the crew, trying to take her out of there. So yeah, we're sort of working through how we're going to sort of solve those issues for, because they're real issues for us. Mm -hmm. And I understand, you know, in some of those communities, it's just the nurse, and you know, she doesn't, <coughs> she or he wants to get that patient out, and so they sometimes won't tell you all of the information because they're desperate to get that person to safety. And that's what happened in this case. Fortunately, it was the pilot that managed the situation with the, with the machete-wielding person and he talked them down while the medical crew worked on the patient to get her ready to take her out. But yeah, so we do face that from time to time and it's, you know, and it's obviously an increasing issue, particularly with the, the drug use uh, in remote communities. Uh, remote communities, Gerald and Bunbury, um, particularly bad for it, Gerald and particularly. No, not really, no. Um, sometimes for remote places like so for Mika Thara, it takes a certain type of person. But our medical crews in Mika Thara are fly in, fly out, so they do a month on, month off. Uh, our pilots stay there permanently, but the, but the uh, medical crews fly in, fly out. No, not in the PC-12, uh, or the 24 actually, no, it's just a curtain. We, <laughs> um, yeah, we, uh, <laughs> just to remember coming out, Carnarvon Hospital were great, they used to bring us out sandwiches and fruit and everything when, they, when we went up there to get a patient. And I remember we were uh, getting out of there, went to get a patient there one day, and they'd given us all our sandwiches and everything, and we were taking off, and the normal process for us in, as the pilots is to shut the curtain at night, because they want all the lights on in the back, and it, it, we can't see out the front with all the lights on in the back, so we like to keep it dark. And we were climbing out of Carnarvon, and the sun had just going down, and um, the patient lost control of their bowels, so the aeroplane wasn't smelling great. <laughs> and um, we were climbing out, and the sun had gone down, and I closed the curtain, and the doctor said, that's not going to help. <laughs> <laughs> I said, yeah, I don't care. I'm still hungry. <laughs> protection on board, such as a revolver or something? Oh, no, nothing like that, no. Um, chemical, so the, so the doctor would have um, ketamine, I guess, would be, but it didn't work on this patient that attacked the nurse and the doctor. Um, but sometimes there's chemical uh, restraint available. But no, no, generally, uh, we have a process now which we've introduced in, with aggressive, if we have an aggressive patient on board um, that we would follow. Um, but, yeah, no, there's no, because we were sort of thinking about protecting our staff in terms of their response to aggression as well, because we, you know, you never know which way a court's going to go. So what does it do to your care to a patient who clearly is a danger to the person's care? Exactly, and that's what, that's what we've grappled with a lot. So we spent a lot of time after the last incident trying to work through how we would manage that. Yeah. You know, the pilot, who's actually a very good friend of mine and is an ex-policeman, and he said, I just hit him with a fire extinguisher. Yes. I said, yeah, <laughs> unfortunately, if, if he got to the cockpit, he said, I was going to hit him with a fire extinguisher. And I said, yeah, but unfortunately, if you killed him, you'd be, yeah, you'd be in trouble. That would be the problem. And then we're for, therefore, we're not providing you with a safe workplace. And, and so, so, you know, I couldn't guarantee your safety or, or your, I couldn't guarantee that we could protect you in court. Mm. 
with his family said but there was nothing wrong with him um so we've come up we have a process now um. and you use restraints yeah we do use restraints yeah for for psych patients mm. for known psych patients we use restraints but as i say the last one had no history of any mental issues mm. it was a pure and simple car accident um so yeah there was no indication that this person was in any way going to be a threat we have uh, quite a cross-section of doctors and nurses that work for us and unfortunately on that particular flight there was a female nurse and a female doctor and neither of them were particularly big you know had it been one of you know like one of our doctors who's about 120 kilos and he's a big aggressive Scotsman then the bloke wouldn't have got off the stretcher but you know because he would have just <laughs> he would have dealt with him but you know they physically couldn't restrain this there was a big man that was that attacked them and they neither of them were particularly big and they weren't going to be able to restrain him so yeah, so it's a, it's a problem. It's not common. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't happen all the time. We've had five in 20 years, but that's five too many. If you text flying doctor to there, you'll, they'll send you a link and you can donate. <laughs> and, and we'd be very grateful.